Hey there, folks. This is Paul Street. This is the Paul Street Report. It is um, September 18th, 2024. It's 1230 in the afternoon. I'm in Chicago. I want to dig into two things today. First, why does what I've called the DSR, the Desirable Socialist Revolution, um, need to be led by communists, revolutionary communists, and be communist in orientation? And here I have three reasons for that. Second, I want to address the common uh, intellectual sentiment that the historical experience of the world's first socialist states, the Soviet Union and, and um, Mao's China, um, was so terrible and so awful um, and criminal and authoritarian um, that, that, that it wipes out, cancels in advance the notion of communism and communist-led socialist revolution. Uh, so let's get started. Um, the DSR, my acronym for the Desirable Socialist Revolution, needs to be communist in leadership and orientation. Three basic reasons. Number one, nobody but dedicated revolutionary communists possess the vision, the courage, and the scientific um, standpoint required to lead a DSR. People who think that Marxism or socialism you know, is about winning a collective bargaining agreement or getting a community garden or putting a woman on the city council, even a Marxist woman like in Seattle on the city council, or getting solar home tax incentives, or just fill in the blank of small incremental changes meant to make life more tolerable under capitalism. Anyone who thinks that, and it's very widespread, this kind of revisionist reformism, this incrementalism, so-called pragmatism, anyone who thinks that is what socialism is. It's not going to lead the desirable socialist revolution that we need because they're not going to fundamentally confront and work with others and organize masses of people to fundamentally confront in the streets, in the public squares, in the workplaces, in the offices, in the political culture, in the schools, in the intellectual culture. They're not going to fight against the many-sided capitalist state, including its coercive apparatuses, to bring that down. And they're not going to go into taking the state power and using it and bringing it down to the taproot socioeconomic capitalist mode of production and radically replace it with a socialist mode of production. That's not going to happen. Only communists are going to do that. Incrementalists will not act boldly, courageously, or scientifically on behalf of what Dr. Martin Luther King at the end of his life rightly called the real and systemic issue to be faced beyond what he called superficial matters. And for him, that was, quote, the radical reconstruction of society itself, not unlike Marx and Engels in 1848, the revolutionary reconstitution of society at large. That's the first reason. Only revolutionary communists are going to understand socialist revolution that way. Second, the proper goal of socialism, and I explained in a previous video why, that, why we have to go all the way with a real actual revolution because of what capitalism is doing to life itself. Second, the proper goal of socialist revolution isn't socialism, actually. This is not understood by a lot of people who call them socialists, but rather communism. What is communism? It's a society free um, of all exploitation of one group of humanity by another group of humanity. By the way, not just class exploitation. It's free of all forms of exploitation and oppression. And it's a society driven, animated uh, in, in, by and embodying uh, the fundamental core ethical communist ideal from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. It is not about winning a bit more democracy or democracy. It's not about winning a bit more equality. I'll get into that in a future video why it isn't about either of those things. Um, socialism, what Marx candidly called the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is something rather different than social democracy or democratic socialism, is not a Shangri-La. It's got all kinds of fucking problems and, and as a consequence requires a revolutionary leadership that is struggling with the continuation of all kinds of negative social and political and ideological and intellectual and culture forces after the revolution. These are things that are only really understood by revolutionary communists. Um, Mao understood this more than any other socialist leader of the last century. And what he understood is that, it, that the socialist revolution 
is just step two. After the overthrow of the old regime. And that the purpose of the socialist revolution, which is the transition to communism, to each according to his abilities, from each according to abilities, to each according to their needs, and the end of all exploitation and oppression, that the long march to that requires a continuing struggle under socialism with the remnants and more of capitalist imperialist society. Class divisions and other oppression structures do not automatically disappear because you've had a revolution. Neither do the whole slew of backwards and harmful ideas and worldviews and sentiments and habits that capitalism refashioned and cooked up. You know, ideas like the belief that human nature is base and dark and competitive. Uh, the notion that race and class and gender inequities are, uh, are, are naturally embedded in, in, in uh, humanity. Uh, the notion that the meaning of life is to accumulate wealth and power and get over on other people. Uh, um, the, life that, the notion that life is under the control of a just and omnipotent God who determines everything like, like you know, like a uh, <clears throat> puppet master. You know, so the struggle against all of that and more under socialism is a struggle for communist consciousness, communist culture and organization, for a defeat of backwards and bourgeois thoughts and forces, and by the way, not just within a national population underneath a socialist government, but within the leadership of that government itself. Uh, capitalism was restored in China through the Communist Party after the death of Mao. In, in a reflection of the persistence of backwards and reactionary and revanchist and capitalist ideas within the vanguard party itself. Without consistent, dedicated revolutionary communism, you're going to end up with Deng Xiaoping. And you're going to end up with the late Soviet Union and Gorbachev and all of that from Khrushchev through Gorbachev. And you're going to basically see the socialist revolution turned into a bourgeois revolution, and you're going to see capitalism restored. And by the way, the restoration of full-on capitalism, sort of via state capitalism, and, the, and particularly the opening of China uh, for the exploitation of its natural and human resources by global capital is one of the greatest disasters of modern history, full of, 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 of apocalyptic uh, consequences that have been ricocheting around the world and that have helped to bring us to a, a, a point right now where we, where the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has the uh, nuclear war and environmental clock closer to midnight than it's ever been. Third, intimately related to points one and two, even the best uh, socialist revolution uh, will be full of forces trying to pull society back to capitalism and back to reinsertion into the world capitalist system um, rather than uh, the difficult tasks of keeping their countries on the path to communism and of using their new democratic, excuse me, their new desirable socialist revolutionary state as a base area for socialist revolutions in another country, which is absolutely essential because any new socialist revolutionary state is going to be surrounded by hostile capitalist imperialist states. And so it, it needs to, and it's, it's essential to its own survival and to its own moral sense of why it exists. It's essential for it to function as the, in Bob Avakian's words, as a base area to promote, enable, encourage socialist revolutions in, in other countries. Well, any, um, any, any, um, any socialist state, um, that comes into being is going to fail in those objectives without dedicated, principled, courageous, steely-eyed, scientific communist leadership that, among other things, has learned from how and why both of the first socialist states, the Soviet Union and then Mao's China, saw their socialist revolutions defeated and turned into de facto bourgeois revolution meltdowns. 
the D, even the best DSR will fall back into the gravitational pull of the bourgeois order if its leadership isn't revolutionary in orientation and communist in orientation with a full understanding of what the point of the socialist revolution is. Which is not an end in and of itself, but a transition to a world beyond all exploitation, a world in which the animating principle is from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. So those are three reasons that you got to have a revolutionary communist leadership for a DSR, for a desirable socialist revolution. There's more, but that's all I've got time to for today. Now, let me go into this common narrative uh, that cancels out communism in advance and that cancels out current day revolutionary communists in advance uh, with reflexive sneering dismissal and dis of and disdain for the 20th century socialist revolutions in states in Russia and China. And along with that, sneering disdain, disrespect, and contempt for revolutionary communist thinkers today. Uh, it's, to, to me, it's all just despicable, okay? This disdain, and it's just also stupid and mistaken and, and historically inaccurate. How explain what Henry Giroux calls the I'm quoting Jewel, prolific left uh, social theorist and, and political critic. How explain what Giroux calls the collapse of the militant hope of socialism into what Giroux calls a century of disastrous betrayals of revolutionary dream, a century of mass murder, and an endless series of self-deceptions about the promise of a future in which human beings realize their full potential. How, how explain the collapse of the revolutionary socialist and communist dream? Well, part of this collapse has to do with the intellectual left's surrender to Western imperial anti-communist Cold War narratives on the last century's first socialist states, in my opinion. Uh, most liberal and left thinkers, not to mention uh, so-called conservative and right-wing thinkers, but most U.S. liberal and left thinkers view the 20th century Russian and Chinese socialist states with automatic, reflexive, and arrogant contempt. Uh, they do so for a variety of reasons that I don't have the time to go completely into right now, but certainly um, in parts of the left and the liberal left, fear of red-baiting and resulting career harm and, and the loss of status and freedom um, is part of the mix. It's only one part of it, but it's certainly one, certainly one big part of it. Whatever the specific mix behind this contempt, uh, the anti-communist intelligentsia's um, knee-jerk denunciation of the socialist regimes that arose in Russia in 1917 and in China in 1949 um, it, it, it capitulates, it surrenders to the dominant Western bourgeois notion that communist-led socialist revolution, well, really any socialist revolution, is nothing more than a uh, disastrous totalitarian recipe for tyranny and catastrophe and the iron heel of 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 of, uh, of vicious violent state power. Uh, this narrative is highly problematic, in my view, and it it deletes four key things. Hence my other part of my title: four del four deletions. Deletion number one: it leaves out the very real and remarkable accomplishments achieved by the by Soviet and Chinese socialism, communist led, Russian and Chinese socialism giant leaps forward in living conditions for millions and millions in lifespan, in literacy, in women's rights, very underestimated achievement in both the Soviet and Chinese revolution, and women's freedom, and more for giant swaths of humanity in vast sections of, of global territory. Big fucking deal. 
<clears throat> there were really big Soviet and Chinese Maoist societal accomplishments that just get completely deleted and, and, and knocked off the screen of understanding in, in, in Western intellectual thought. Uh, J.P. Nettle, The Soviet Accomplishment, find that book. Um, uh, I'm blanking on the first name, uh, last name Hinton, Fan Shen, The Story of the Impact of the Chinese Revolution on uh, Peasant Women, among other things. Great reads. Deletion number two. The standard anti-communist narrative on the USSR and Maoist China leaves out the terrible consequences beyond as well as within the former socialist state of the overthrow of what was once really existing socialism with all its flaws in Russia and China. Anyone who thinks that the world is a better place because Ecocidal imperialist global capitalism has been permitted to reclaim these vast swaths of territory and to exploit natural and human resources on a gargantuan scale in Russia and China and Eastern Europe. And then to turn both China and Russia into armed to the teeth, nuclear equipped, capitalist, imperialist states in their own regard. Anyone who thinks that that's a victory for humanity is completely out of their fucking mind. And I'll make reference yet again to the combined ecological, capitalist generated ecological disaster and the threat and the escalated threat of nuclear war between the United States and newly fully capitalist, imperialist Russia and and newly, historically speaking, fully capitalist imperial China has brought the bulletin of atomic, atomic scientists doomsday clock closer to midnight than it's ever been. Deletion number three. The reigning Western narrative about the inherent awfulness of the socialist revolutions in Russia and China in the last century, this reigning narrative says nothing about how completely unsurprising the difficulties and failures experienced by Soviet Russia and Maoist China were in light of the enormous challenges those new socialist states faced. And by that, I mean continuing forces of internal counter-revolution and mass inertia, ideological and cultural lag, and above all, imperial encirclement. As the revolutionary communist leader Bob Avakian wrote in his 2005 book, Phony Communism is Dead, Long Live Real Communism, quote, in China as well as in the Soviet Union, the danger of capitalist restoration was rooted in the underlying contradictions marking socialism as a transition from capitalism to communism. The triumph of the capitalist roaders in China, the capitalist roaders in China, 1976, Avakian writes, quote, was the outcome of the class struggle both within the socialist countries and internationally. The loud proclamations these days about the failure of communism, Avakian writes, fail to recognize that what has happened in the Soviet Union and China represents defeats inflicted on the international proletariat by the international bourgeoisie. These proclamations also fail to see that Avakian said, quote, wrote, the mistakes made by Soviet and Chinese communist leaders were mainly mistakes made in dealing with the very real problems and, problems and dangers caused primarily by imperialism, particularly in the early stages of the conflict between proletarian revolution and bourgeois counter-revolution. The point of Avakian writes in Phony Communism is Dead Along with Real Communism. Communism. The point is to learn from such defeats, to learn the lessons in order to turn temporary setbacks into new breakthroughs. <clears throat> According to the um, different type of Marxist writer, Michael Parenti, Soviet socialism was always a system under siege. 
Indeed. Always a system under siege. And the same goes for Chinese socialism with the unfortunate proviso that the Soviets themselves were among those laying siege to Mao's China. Without the external hostility and the imperial encirclement and provocation that the Soviet Union and Mao's China faced, and without the hoped for sympathetic socialist revolutions in other nations, things would have gone quite differently in Soviet Russia and Mao's China and in the whole world during the last half century, during which time, at the risk of beating a dead horse, global capitalist rule has brought humanity to the literal cliff of annihilation. I have an old friend of mine from Northern Illinois University who says that socialism and communism uh, uh, um, um, produce dystopias. You want to see a fucking dystopia? Nothing that socialism or communism, any crime it committed is on remotely on scale with the dystopian, ecocidal extermination of humanity that is that is increasingly imminent under the rule of capital and capital's empire. The accomplishments of the Russian and Chinese revolutions would have been immeasurably greater. The mistakes and indeed the crimes committed in the name of socialism in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Empire, and in socialist China would have been much slighter. Soviet and Chinese socialism without imperial encirclement and provocation might not only have survived, but thrived in ways that would have inspired sympathetic allied socialist revolutions in other countries, putting humanity on the path to a world beyond the soulless and ecocidal anarchy and oppression of capitalist dictatorship. Galicia number four. Uh, the intelligentsia includes droves of so-called left thinkers who falsely assume that revolutionary Marxists who think more positively than they do about the Soviet Union and China they, they operate on this completely false assumption that such thinkers like Avakian, and in his own way, um, a less revolutionary Marxist like Michael Parenti, there's this assumption that these thinkers have no substantive criticisms of how those states and their leaders responded to the challenges they encountered. And this is just completely false. In his uh, book, Black Shirts and Reds, Rational Fascism and the Overthrow of Communism, Parenti, combined defense of the Soviet Union's considerable socialist accomplishments uh, with some really forthright criticism of the Soviet Union's internal managerial and political failures. The Mao-inspired Revolutionary Communist Party, USA, the Revcoms, and their leader, Bob Avakian, have long combined appreciation of the accomplishments of socialist Russia and socialist China. They've combined that appreciation with significant critiques of mistakes made not just by the criminal Stalin and his revisionist successors, but also by Lenin and Mao. Even Marx comes in for some very interesting and instructive criticism from Baba Vicky, not to mention Mao. Denying the real achievements of socialist Russia and China and failing to understand the international and historical context within which their failures, crimes, and mistakes occurred means an all too easy surrender to the hegemonic bourgeois notion that the call for socialist revolution is nothing but an invitation to totalitarian nightmare. Meanwhile, the horrific socioeconomic, political, and environmental consequences of the overthrow of socialism in Russia and China have been, like I said, ricocheting around the world 
for decades and now have accumulated and concentrated in this uh, 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 dire existential moment of supreme environmental and nuclear danger that has the bulletin of atomic scientists doomsday clock closer to midnight than it's ever been. That's what happens under the anarchy of global capital, which has brought the uh, world arguably closer to um, termination than anything uh, 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 that was developing during the Cold War period. Uh, uh, I know that's all not what most of the left intelligentsia wants to hear. And I know they also don't want to hear anything good about revolutionary communism and its leader, Avakian, who gets their undies all up in a bunch and gets them rolling their eyes and snarking on their keyboards and you know, keyboards and you know about that. This is really all I have to say. Get over that. Tough shit. Get those undies of yours straightened out. Unbunch him. Fucking read the guy and try to get your head screwed on right because the shit is getting really, really serious. We are running out of time for anything less than a communist-led socialist revolution in the United States and around the world. Oh, my goodness, I did 26 minutes again. Well, there you go. This is, these are big topics, and uh, I want to have my say on them. Talk to you next time.